righty. Today's scripture is from Acts 19, verses 1 and 2. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Is it on? Yeah. Good. <laughs> As I was coming up here today, I was reminded of an interview that I uh, saw while I was messing around with our computer. And an uh, interviewer was uh, talking to Douglas Gresham, who was C.S. Lewis's stepson. And um, C.S. Lewis continued to uh, raise him after his wife died. But uh, Gresham tells the story of how C.S. Lewis would, uh, whenever they'd go to church in one of the big fancy cathedrals in, in uh, London there, he would sit behind in a special seat with a big, one of the big marble columns that, that support the roof. He would sit behind that because it was directly in line with the pulpit. And uh, he had a tendency to fall asleep, and he didn't want the, the vicar to see him sleeping. He said the reason he fell asleep was the the church was pretty much dead, you know. And the, the vicar, the only thing he would talk about would, was church history and never mention anything spiritual during the sermon, so he'd fall asleep. So... Well, I'm not a preacher, I'm, I'm a historian, so if, if any of you fall asleep, I won't take offense at it, because if it's good enough for C.S. Lewis, it's good enough for you. <laughs> and there, sorry, there's no Collins in this church. Okay, two weeks ago I ban, uh, began a, a three-part series dealing with the uh, Nicene Creed. Well, Nicene Creed basically is an apology or a defense of the doctrine of the Trinity, and there were so many different isms that were popping up everywhere that uh, in 325, the Emperor Constantine uh, convened the First Ecumenical Council at Nicaea, and that's why it's called the Nicene Creed. But the uh, story goes that Constantine was converted to Christianity because he had a vision and uh, where he dedicated his life and the battle that he was waging, he, he won the battle, so he turned his life over to, to Christ. But there, there are people that, uh, historians that say, well, that, that never really happened. That was, that's just legend. But uh, uh, Joel 22, 28 through 29 has something to say about that. Joel says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Adam Clark, who's a real known commentator, claims, the gifts of teaching and instructing men shall not be restricted to any one class or order of people. And I would add to that statement, nor are they limited to one generation. Prophesy here doesn't mean um, foretelling the future. I looked it up, and the, the dictionary definition is preach, exhort, 
pray or instruct. So, other historians claim that Constantine never was really a Christian. He just was in it for the uh, for po political reasons. His words, his own words, in his life refute that claim. This is a letter from Constantine written to the Church of Alexandria in reference to the Nicene Creed. He writes, Constantine writes, for what was approved by 300 bishops can only be considered as the pleasure of, <coughs> pleasure of God, especially as the Holy Spirit dwelling in the minds of so many uh, and such worthy men has clearly shown the divine will Wherefore, let no one hesitate, let no one delay, but let all return with eager readiness to the path of truth, that when, with all convenient speed, I shall visit you, I may offer with you due thanks to the searcher of all hearts, that having made known to you the unadulterated faith he has restored to us, that mutual charity which was so much to be desired, may the divine being watch over you my beloved brother. That's uh, not the words of a, a man, a Christian in, in uh, name only. Those are the words of one who has known and been filled with the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, I handed out copies of the Nicene Creed, and at the bottom was the uh, Chalcedonian definition of faith as well, which uh, in 451 actually uh, ratified the, the creeds. And you notice on the top of that page it says 325 and 381. So there's two creeds, right? No, they're the same creed. But there's reasons for that. Um, Constantine died in 337 AD, and his sons took over. They formed what's called a triumvirate, a three-man rule. And... Uh, in 337. One of them was named Constans, the other one was Constantius, and the other one was Constantine the second. And they all had portions of the the uh, Roman Empire. Constantine the second ruled the Western em Empire. Constantius uh, ruled the Eastern Empire uh, around Constantinople. And, the, and Constans ruled Italy and uh, Northern Africa. But in 340, Cons Constantine II decided he was going to take over Italy and he waged war against Constans, his brother, which didn't turn out too good for him because he was killed in battle in, in 340, so the, the entire empire was split between the two brothers. But both the brothers were Arians. The, that, uh, that heresy that... Uh, that denied the divinity of Christ. Well, they ruled till 361 when Constantius died. But when he died, he turned the uh, the empire over to a, a man named Julian, and he's called Julian the Apostate because he was raised a Christian but denied Christianity and ruled in in Rome for for two years and brought paganism back. Uh, in a big way and uh, after two years he died and another guy came to office and only lasted eight months then a new dynasty arose uh, of, uh, of, and it was a triumvirate too and uh, there were three people uh, three men one of their grandsons was a, a man named Theodosius. He came to power in 379, and he was a dedicated Orthodox Christian, a, a student of St. Ambrose, who was one of the church fathers. And uh, he considered it his duty to reunify the Christian church under the earlier Nicene Creed. So he convened a second ecumenical council in 381, and they re-ratified the, the creed, but they added to it a definition of the Holy Spirit. The old old creed of 325 ended with the words, and in the Holy Spirit, and they made no 
reference to the character of the Holy Spirit. So they, uh, they added this phrase, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, and who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. That statement of faith acknowledges that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. There's a word in there. Um, it says giver of life. Well, that's not a real good translation. The Greek word actually zoopoion is the word, and it literally means maker of life. We can give gifts to others, and we don't necessarily, we aren't the ones that made those gifts. We can give a gift of a, like a, a kidney or a piece of our liver to prolong, prolong life, but we cannot give life. Only God can give life. So, Genesis 2, 7 states, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Hebrew word for breath of life is na'ashma, and it literally means soul or spirit. We know God raised Jar the daughter of Jarius from the dead, and Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, God can restore an entire nation to life, if he wishes, after it has become spiritually dead. That nation of England was brought back to life by the efforts of one man, guided and filled by the Holy Spirit. I bought this book many, many years ago. Uh, it was a book in a home study course. I probably had it for 40 years. And on the back here, it says, it was an age of violence, sexual permissiveness, and alcoholism. The church was corroded by secularism, despised by the intellectuals, and consistently ignored by the masses. It was 18th century England. But one man reached the common people where others failed. His name was John Wesley. <clears throat> Why did he succeed? What made him effective in a day when the rest of the church was not? What made John Wesley? I've got a document here. It's called the Wesleyan Perspective, and it, and it tells about John Wesley. I, I took this out of my my Wesley Bible that I bought at seminary, and I thought this is a pretty good statement. It says, in many ways, John Wesley's thought represents the mainstream of Christian tradition. While this is a sweeping statement, it is not indefensible, nor is, nor is it surprising. He was raised and spent all his life in the Anglican Church, which gave him both an understanding of and an appreciation for the Catholic faith. But Wesley's mother was the daughter of a noted Puritan divine who imbued in her children the Puritan concern for righteousness based on principles derived from the revealed word. In the midst of all this, as an 18th century Oxford student and later instructor, Wesley developed a thoroughgoing commitment to rationality. In addition to these influences, Wesley had a lifelong interest in the Eastern Orthodox Church. That's where the night seeing creed comes through. So. However, all that training and education did not prepare him to become the great evangelist he would. Wesley was lacking one thing. Throughout his life, Wesley had been felt called to God's work. So on October 14, 1735, Wesley set, set sail for America to Georgia where he'd be a missionary. Well, then on uh, December 22nd, 1737, he set sail back to England, just one step ahead of the law, basically. He was about to be arrested. He'd made such a mess of, uh, of his uh, mission in England that uh, he's running from the law. His time in America had been a dismal, dismal failure. 
But it was that failure that changed Wesley into the man that he would become. God can take our dismal failures and use them to mold us into the men and women that he wants us to be. Wesley writes about the experience that changed his life. Uh, seeking uh, guidance and uh, hope, help, he uh, attended a meeting in Aldersgate Street in London uh, to hear the preaching of a uh, Moravian past uh, preacher, 26-year-old Peter Burler is the guy's name, and he states what happened in the, at that meeting. He writes, about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. <coughs> I felt I did, I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and that assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. He would later call this experience entire sanctification, and that's the basis for the Methodist Church, the result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For the next 53 years, he would spread the message to England, Ireland, Wales, and France, and to America by Francis Asbury. Another book I got at home is written by Stephen Tompkins. It's a biography of John Wesley. He states, Wesley did more than anyone to reintroduce the, the religion of the heart in, into 18th century England. Methodism was full of music and excitement, dreams and divine impulses, emotional turmoil and mass fervor, what was called fanaticism by the church. But Wesley insisted it is no more than heart religion. In other words, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. These must be felt or they have no being. Excluding these from religion leaves it a dry, dead carcass. That's Wesley's message is still being preached today. The Free Methodist Book of Discipline in the chapter labeled Purpose and Character of, of the Free Methodist Church states, in doctrine, free Methodist believe, beliefs are the standard beliefs of evangelical Arminian Protestantism, with distinct, distinctive emphasis on entire sanctification, as held by John Wesley. In experience, free Methodists stress the reality of an inner cleansing and power that attests to the doctrine of entire sanctification, both in the inward consciousness of believers and in the outward life. For, for, for me, and most of you here, those are more than words. Those are, or words are religious theory. Those are the truth. They are our own experience and reality. I've, I've got just a few uh, examples of of the experiences I've had where the Holy Spirit was, I mean, there in a powerful, powerful way. I had just been saved and sanctified in, in 1976, so the church sent me and the pastor's son to a seminar uh, we were both Sunday school teachers. I taught the junior high Sunday school, and he taught the the, uh, the junior high Sunday school, and he taught the high school Sunday school class. They sent us to a seminar, uh, instructing us how to to teach, basically. And uh, we came back, and we had uh, a bunch of my students from my Sunday school class came to my sister's house, sister and brother-in-law's house. And we were going to uh, show them what we had learned, and we did. And the Holy Spirit was came in a big way, and everybody there was was saved as a result. It's just another time. 
Vicki and I and our kids went to uh, a summer camp at Pine Hill Campground north of, of Spokane. And uh, the special um, speaker that day uh, was Elmer Smeldenbaugh, who was uh, the first Nazarene uh, missionary in Sw Swaziland. Just a uh, tremendous speaker. He spoke for two hours, uh, and people just kept saying, oh, keep going, keep going, tell us more. And he told stories of how the Holy Spirit had protected him at times, just, uh, just really some amazing stories. Well, uh, finally, he got so tired, he said, I've got to sit down. And they, so they brought the uh, meeting to a close. They closed with this hymn, uh, Come Thou Fount. And he did. Just, just, the presence was so powerful, it was amazing. And, uh, People stood up and testified, saying, "We'd always heard about, you know, the Holy Spirit and, and sanctification. We didn't really believe it, you know, because we'd never seen it." Well, a lot of people were filled with the Spirit that day. And then another time, we'd uh, moved to, to Moscow where I enrolled in college, and we uh, attended the Nazarene Church in Troy, Idaho. And there was uh, a lot of trouble in the church. There was a lot of division, and basically over the, uh, the pastor's wife wore a lot of makeup and not real plain dresses. Nothing bad, just she was flashy, I guess they considered it. And it caused a lot of trouble in the church. It really did. So the pastor asked me and Vicky to pray with him and, and his wife. So the four of us was gathered, held hands, and prayed. And Vicky could attest to this. The Spirit was there so powerfully that I had just about collapsed. My knees started shaking, my hands started shaking, and, and all four of us uh, felt the power of the Spirit. And the pastor and his wife decided to, uh, it would be better for them to take a church someplace else on the district rather than continue to, to cause dissension in the church. And that was uh, through the influence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and one more, one more. Several years ago, there was a, a group called Promise Keepers that uh, went around. A bunch of preachers got together and had held big meetings. Well, they held a meeting in uh, in Seattle at the Kingdom, and there were thousands of people there. The Kingdom was just completely full, and a uh, a bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church was the final speaker. And he preached and had an altar call. <coughs> and there were literally hundreds of men came forward. It shocked shocked the, the promoters of the conference there. They didn't expect that. And uh, so they, they were asking ministers and pastors in the congregation to, to come out. That's the power of the Holy. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to end the message with a question that Paul asked the disciples: Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were believed? For the born again Christian, that answer is yes. But John Wesley would continue with a, another question. Were you filled by the Holy Spirit? There's a difference. We are, as Christians, 
when we are converted, when we receive Christ as our Savior, we're initially sanctified. But there will come a crisis in later when we give our lives totally to Christ and we are entirely sanctified. That's the foundation doctrine of the Wesleyan Methodist type churches. Now I'll end with uh, something that that proves that uh, the spirit is still working today. Uh, a week ago, uh, we received a, a movie that we sent off for. I saw an interview with Kelsey Grammer, who is a, played Frazier on TV. Well, he is in a movie. It's called The Jesus Revolution. It's a tremendous <laughs> movie. But uh, in April 1966, Time magazine had a, a cover, magazine cover, that in red letters, big red letters, said, Is God Dead? April of 1966. In 1971, that same magazine, Time magazine, had a cover, on the cover, a picture of Christ said, Jesus Revolution. And it's a story of what actually happened. Uh, a pastor, Chuck Smith, was uh, his church was just shrinking constantly, and his daughter had heard a, a young street preacher preach, a hippie. So she had this man. His name was uh, uh, Lonnie Frisbee. <laughs> came and, and preached at the church and brought all his friends and that movement just spread everywhere uh, and he uh, came in contact with Greg Glory who is a well known pastor today evangelist and that movement just s spread everywhere well movement of the Holy Spirit is there. It's a couple of years ago they had the revival sprung up in, in uh, Esri College and it will happen again. And the state that our country is in and the state that the world is in, we need revival. I, I see the face of the, I see in your face is the Holy Spirit. I really do. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir. But maybe some of you have friends or relatives that don't know Christ. We need to make sure that they know Christ and know that the Holy Spirit can control their lives. I thank you for letting me preach. It's been a privilege. It's a, it's a chore, but it, it's, it's been a privilege. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you. We thank you for everyone that has, has gathered here. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that has touched each and every one of us. Continue to be with us, we pray, Lord. And may this be a time that we can think about how you do touch our lives. Now, we give you thanks. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Do we have time for testimony? Hmm? Do we have time for testimony? Yes, we do. Anybody want to testify?